You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Gentlemen, welcome once again to the Bagger Night Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schliff. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. Well, we did it. The uh, reviews are beyond the uh, the mile marker, so I will give you a reprieve. I'm planning this weekend to start reaching out to people about doing the, uh, well, maybe tonight. I don't know. We'll see how things go. But start doing the uh, mock drafts with some of the listeners. For those of you that are... Uh, interested and available we'll get something done this weekend but anyways i really do appreciate uh you know the call to action the 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 ratings and reviews that you guys went out and did i never ever would have expected that that happened so easily and so quickly but uh moving on because we're not talking about that anymore if anybody has any questions or if you'd like to uh reach out have your opinions put out there in the what grinds my gear segment 608-501-0718 Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place and you can get the app and try it out for yourself so go ahead and test drive u.s cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days that's u.s cellular built for us terms apply awards based on open signal independent data so go to uscellular.com for all the details i want to pick up right where we left off I want to make sure we get through all the uh, the questions and comments and whatnot, and uh, we'll see where that leaves us. So this is kind of good because one of the biggest talking points is, uh, of course, one of the questions. So that helps. So I want to start right from uh, from there. Appropriately, this question came from Kyle from Kansas once again. And actually, this this is not a uh, the question a question. There are questions in it, but uh, this is a statement. Here it is: The Packers need Jordy back. My point is, what if Devontae gets hurt? Who can you see stepping up? Geronimo, MVS, EQ, Kumro, Jamon. Step up from last year, yes. Step up to be a number one, no. After two years of injuries with Watt Rodgers, we can't have another lost season. By the way, I'm not just saying this because I was able to meet him and name my son after him either. It's fine because nobody in Green Bay has any bias on this issue, so it's fine. I absolutely believe you that you're unbe- being unbiased. I am also unbiased. I couldn't care less if it was Jordy or somebody else we were talking about. There is no emotional attach- attachment to Jordy Nelson whatsoever. That doesn't exist. I also did receive a call, uh, Ben from Sockville, Wisconsin. He had a two-part question, and the first part was the same thing, basically. So I'll address that, and then we'll double back to uh, catch the second part of Ben's question. But, um, you know, I... I'm trying as hard as I can to jump on the Jordy bandwagon and find a reason that it makes sense, and I just kind of can't do it, but I'm going to do my best. 
you know, before I get to the part where I say we all know this isn't going to happen because that's obviously how this is going to end and you all know that this is how it's going to end. And if you don't know that, well, then I, oh, okay, it's cool. All right, that's fine. So he, here's the thing, and I, listen, I think I was on the pro Jordy bandwagon a long time ago. I don't understand necessarily why we cut him. Here is my recollection and my train of thought of, of exactly how things went. Jordy Nelson has been a very, very, very good receiver pretty much since forever, but his best three years, and this is backed by pro football focus, but also just, you know, I mean, we, we saw the chemistry grow. But 2013, 2014, and 2016 when he came back from injury, right? We're not talking about he got injured and he was never the same. I'm talking about he came back from injury were three of some of the best years he ever had. It was also the three years where he had over 1,000 uh, total snaps. So the guy was out there every play. He was the clear number one, right? We didn't have a bunch of other wide receivers he was rotating with. He was out there, and he was just dominant. The weirdest part for me is the fact that in 2017, again, my recollection, things got off to a great start in 2017. The Packers looked like a dominant football team. Aaron Rodgers looked like he was on fire. This was a team that was just going to play out of control. Well, Aaron Rodgers ended up getting hurt. Everything was fine until Rodgers got hurt, and then everything was terrible. And Jordy Nelson never got the ball once. And I remember that was the first time I'd ever seen Jordy Nelson angry, upset, and it looked like he just didn't want to play anymore. It kind of looked like Ha Ha Clinton Dix, where he just wasn't trying anymore. And it was frustrating to see that, but at the same time, we had a quarterback that couldn't do anything. Brett Hundley was horrible. I started my podcast that year, so I have a pretty solid recollection of how these things happened. Because I remember screaming them into the microphone. As bad as my memory is, those things get burned into my brain. And the fact of the matter is, Jordy Nelson was pretty good at a couple things. One is burning guys deep, and Hundley had no ability to throw the ball beyond five yards, at least not accurately. I don't know how many times he had a guy beat wide open down the field, and uh, you know Hundley launches back and it lands, I don't know, 10 yards short or something ridiculous. And you just see Jordy throw up his hands and go, this is, this is dumb. What are we doing here? The other thing is the chemistry and the timing throws between Aaron Rodgers and Jordy Nelson, which are things in which... Jordy Nelson is only going to be good in one place, and that's Green Bay. That was real, and that was true. And the fact of the matter is, again, he did play well through week six before Aaron Rodgers got hurt. Everything was fine. Nobody, nobody was saying, what's going on with Jordy Nelson? He just doesn't have it anymore at the beginning of the season. Nobody said that. And I just remember as the season went on, and I'm watching this, and it just it made perfect sense to me. The problem isn't our receivers. The problem is the quarterback can't throw it to the receivers. And Devontae was fine, partially because Devontae is such a dominant wide receiver, but also partially because it was a better fit for what Hundley could do. He's a better route runner, so he can get open. He also can get open closer to the line of scrimmage. He's not a burner. He doesn't usually get open down the field. And and even though he can do that now, and we've seen that now that Aaron Rodgers is back, that's not what he was doing when Hundley and Devontae were able to be on the same page. But keep in mind, nobody, Randall Cobb was trash the year Hundley was out there. Geronimo, everybody, everybody, with the exception of Devontae Adams, was pure garbage. But here's the thing, Brett Hundley isn't the quarterback anymore. Aaron Rodgers is. And the fact that everybody looks back at 2017 and says, yeah, I remember, he was garbage that year because he's washed up now. Packers fans, who know what happened, who saw what happened. The beginning of the year, Jordy was fine, and they were in sync, in sync, and everything was going great. Week one against Seattle, eight targets, seven receptions, 79 yards, and a touchdown. Week two, it looks like he got hurt. He only played like seven snaps. Week three, nine targets, six receptions, 52 yards, two touchdowns. Thank you very much. Week four against Chicago, seven targets, four receptions, 75 yards, two touchdowns. Mr. I get more touchdowns than anybody in the NFL is off to getting five touchdowns in four games. So this is where Aaron Rodgers ends up getting hurt against Chicago. So again, we're talking three games in which Jordy played. Every single one of these games, he had a good or almost good pro football focus grade. A minimum of 52 yards, a minimum of seven targets, a minimum of four receptions, And a minimum of one touchdown, a total of five touchdowns in three games. Then Brett Hundley comes in. Granted, the first two games at least have a glimmer of hope. 
Against Dallas, only four targets, which is a low, probably a career low. Only two receptions for 24 yards, but a touchdown, so a little glimmer of hope. Week six against Minnesota, 10 targets, which is a lot. Six receptions, which is a lot. 60 yards, zero touchdowns. By the way, he did have a pretty good PFF grade in that game as well. But that was the end of the, the, the glimmer of hope. Uh, week five, he had his one touchdown. Week six, he had 10 targets, six receptions, which is a lot. After that, everything just fell apart. Three targets, one reception, 13 yards, zero touchdowns. Seven, four, 35 and zero. Four, three, 20 and zero. Five, two, 24 and zero. Five, three, 11, zero. Seven, five, 17, zero. Five, four, 33, zero. Five, three, 28, zero. Five, three, 11, zero. Five touchdowns, three games. Brett Hundley comes in, one touchdown. That's 11 games, one touchdown. And for some reason, Packer fans look at this and go, oh yeah, Jordy's washed up. <laughs> wait a minute, just, just, just wait. Just hold on one second. How is that, how is that what we come to? How is that what our brain comes to? Now, I don't know what he is today. Because every single one of those games, he was getting a day older. Then he got a little bit older in the offseason. Then he went and played for the Raiders. And regardless of what happened over there, he got a lot older. At this particular point in time, he's 33 going on 34 years old. Now, we can get into why it doesn't make any sense, and we will. But if, if your thought process is, we shouldn't bring him up, shouldn't bring him back because he's trash... I, I don't know that we've seen that so much. I mean, he he, he was, quote-unquote, good with Oakland. And by the way, Oakland is kind of trash, and Carr is not very good, especially when we talk about the way that they're utilized, because Carr also does not throw the ball deep. So it's not a good combination of skill set. It, it, and listen, I think Jordy either needs to retire or come back to Green Bay, or at least try to find somebody that fits his skill set. But the, the fact of the matter is, I think only in Green Bay could he possibly have another year or two because the only two things he does well are beat people deep, if he can still do that, and the chemistry that he had with Aaron Rodgers. Those are the things that made him special. The reason he had five touchdowns in three games isn't because he's the most athletic person in the world. It's because when the play breaks down, he knows what to do. And in the red zone, it's basically one big play breakdown. right? Aaron Rodgers n almost never, back in the day when Jordy was there, hit that guy right out of his break. No. He drops back, he dances around behind this offensive line back when we had an off awesome offensive line before Ted Thompson threw everybody away, and he'd just dance and dance and dance and wait for Randall Cobb, Devontae Adams, Jordy Nelson, James Joe, whoever it was, to just, to just find a way, and usually it was Jordy or Cobb, and they would, and it was especially Jordy, and that's how he ended up having more touchdowns than anybody in the NFL, because those two just had a telepathic connection. I don't necessarily think that's going to be gone, so at the very least... It's not hard to make a decision that Jordy Nelson should not come back. I'm not telling you that he should, because I've already said that I'm not going to conclude that today. But please do not say that he had a bad year in 2017, because you're remembering it incorrectly. If Aaron Rodgers never got hurt, he would have had an unbelievable year. Here's the other thing. I don't know that that would have kept him in Green Bay. I don't think the Packers necessarily saw it as he's no good anymore. I think the Packers realized that they had Devontae Adams. The Packers realized that they had just paid Devontae Adams. And the question then became, who do we keep? Because as I said, in that Tom Grassi interview with uh, Mark Murphy, he said once they had paid uh, Devontae Adams, it was kind of done. Because you can only spend so much at the wide receiver position. And they're paying Jordy a lot of money. They're paying Cobb a lot of money. They're paying Devontae a lot of money. That's three guys who are getting a lot of money. Somebody's got to go. So when it came time to decide if we we're going to pay Jordy Nelson again, the answer was, no, we're not. He's, he's just, it's just, it's more of an age thing. I mean, he's one of the few football players I can say that's actually older than I am. Not that that's actually, a, it's, it's weird that I'm at that age. Like, if you're younger than me, you got you got maybe a year left. If you're older than me, it's time to hang it up, man, unless you're a kicker or a quarterback. But that's sort of the crux of what we're getting at here. I don't like the idea of calling Jordy Nelson a untalented football player. I think he has limitations, but I think in the right situation he can maybe thrive. And I know in Green Bay he could thrive, but that's not the point. The point is, I think even if he had had a good year that year, I don't know if he comes back. I think maybe it gave them some leverage to possibly try to 
you know, finagle a trade, you know, I don't know if you'd franchise it. I don't think that would make any sense. Or, you know, some compensation or whatever. But I don't think we would have re-signed him. I think at, at 32 years old, already paying Randall Cobb a lot of money, already paying Devontae a lot of money, and then we go out and sign Jimmy Graham because we want a stud tight end, you know, that kind of stuff. They had made the decision at that point, we just can't afford to bring him back. And I think that has a lot more to do with it than his the fact that he couldn't get in sync with uh, Brett Hundley. And so with that said, what sense would it make for them to change course? I mean, I suppose you could say, well, we're, we're not going to bring back Randall Cobb, so we got a little bit of money. Yeah, maybe. But then we got to ask the question, do we want Cobb or do we want Jordy? I mean, it's, it's somewhat horse apiece with the exception of the age. And the, the only reason I say a horse, horse apiece, because um, Randall seems to be not performing all that well, even with Rodgers. But, but we have excuses for that too, right? He, he was bad in 2017 because Rodgers was hurt. He wasn't great in 2018 because he was hurt, right? I, we can play the same game. And I have. I've made the case for, for bringing back Randall Cobb. If you go back prior to 2017, the guy was on fire. Randall Cobb and Jordy Nelson in 2016 were unbelievable wide receivers. It was an incredible duo. The very next year, we had an incredible, you know, trio, except our quarterback got hurt. That, I mean, I, it's really upsetting because that could have been a very good year. It started off fantastic. The offense looked incredible in 2017, and then Aaron Rodgers got hurt. Uh, beyond that though there becomes a question of the roster and this is kind of a problem that I've come up with for a couple other positions and some people care more than others but how many wide receivers are we going to keep on this team and who are we going to get rid of in place of Jordy Nelson who are going to keep for one year just so that he can come back just so that we can we can and by the way one more selling point and I uh, talked to a friend of mine about this you would never have a more popular game with the exception of maybe the Super Bowl then let's just paint this picture here. Let's say week one is against the Chicago Bears. And supposedly, it's supposed to be that. It was reported that the season opener in 2019 is going to be Packers-Bears again. So just imagine this picture. Week one of the season, right? Already pretty excited. Packer fans want to get out there. Weather's nice. Let's let's go see the Packers. I want to see them in person. So just right out of the gate, pretty good game to go to. It's week one. Beyond that, LaFleur's first game as a head coach. That's a selling point. You want to go see that. Week one, you also get to see all the brand new draft picks. Week one, you also get to see Zadarius Smith, Preston Smith, and all the other guys that we sign. So it's a big draw. There's a lot new in Green Bay, and everybody wants to go see it. Here's number two. Adrian Amos and Ha Ha Clinton Dix are on separate teams. It was just last year, 2018. Ha Ha Clinton Dix was a Packer, and Adrian Amos was a bear, and they've switched, and the fan bases are at each other's throat about who is better and who is worse. Packer fans are rallying hard behind Adrian Amos. Chicago Bears fans are now suddenly huge Ha Ha Clinton Dix fans, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. This would be a massive game. I mean, I, I, I had mentioned you could set the ticket price at $400, and between Packers fans and Bears fans, that thing would sell out in a day. Lambeau Field would sell out in a day. Now, add into that... Jordy Nelson coming running out of the tunnel as a Packer once again. That would be, I mean, it, it, assuming the Packers went to the Super Bowl, this would be like the number two game. Super Bowl, the season opener with Jordy Nelson, Chicago Bears, Packers, all that stuff. And then after that would be, you know, the, uh, the NFC Championship. Just in, what, what an unbelievable thing that would be. And just in general, having Jordy back. I, I can't imagine the roar of the crowd. And, and, and how loud this crowd would be just in jet. Lambeau Field would never, not that it's a really high bar, because Lambeau Field and, and let's face it, us as fans, we, we got to be better, man. I think, you know what? Little segue. 2019, that is going to be one of, one of my particular missions, and I know a lot of people are on that on Twitter. We got to start some kind of a campaign. We're going to be better in 2019. People need to be on their feet. People need to be screaming. You got plenty of time to sit. When the offense is on the field and you're quiet, you take a nap for all I care. I didn't pay for that ticket. I'm watching on TV. Your job is to just be quiet and make sure there's no noise. And if anybody does the wave, I mean, I'm not going to advocate violence on this podcast, but man, oh man. Anyways, think about how loud it would be. And not just when Jordy comes out, but how loud it's going to be when Ha Ha comes out from all the Bears fans because you know they're going to buy up a bunch of tickets. 
just to be spiteful, just to cheer the man on. But beyond that, how many how many of the fans are, you know, there's going to be some Packers fans that are cheering ha-ha, some Packers fans are going to be booing. The The roar of the crowd is going to erupt when ha-ha comes out. How loud is it going to be when Amos comes out? Zadarius Smith, Preston Smith, this place is going to be just out of control already. Forget Jordy. This place is going to be nuts, but I'm just saying add in Jordy to that equation. Wow. I would have to go to that. I don't even really care for going to games. I'd rather watch it on TV. I can see more, and it's more comfortable. I'm at my house. I don't have to drive all the way to Green Bay. I don't have to fight traffic. I don't have to be crammed in the seat and sit in this uncomfortable chair from where I'm sitting a mile away from the field, and I can't even see what's going on. I don't know. I don't understand the draw of going to a game, to be completely honest, but uh, whatever. I'm glad people like to go there. Somebody's got to do it so that I can sit at home on my recliner and yell at people for not being loud enough at the stadium in the cold while I eat my pizza. That did not cost forty-eight dollars, because that's the kind of guy I am. No, but seriously, I don't. I don't care how much that ticket costs you, and I don't care about your rights. You will scream. This defense is new look defense, man. Mean, mean guys. Zadarius Smith is a monster. Preston Smith is just a mean. Zadarius Smith is like Julius Peppers, where even when he's smiling, and I, I'm I'm sorry, I'm segueing here. Let me try to put a point on this. Jordy Nelson is going to be thirty-four years old. The wide receiver room is already overcrowded. And granted, although they're very young and and he could probably come in and be wide receiver two day one, and I genuinely believe that. I think that's a a negative because that means there's no growth from anybody, which means we've drafted horribly and we should probably just cut the guys we have. But it's it's just too crowded and then we have to get rid of somebody. Who are we going to get rid of? We already signed Geronimo. We're not getting rid of Geronimo. We we shouldn't get rid of Jamon or Equinemius or Marquez. Are we going to get rid of Jay Kumaro and... and, uh, Trevor Davis, just because. I know everybody wants Trevor Davis gone anyways, but should we just get rid of somebody who's a long-term answer because we want to bring back Jordy for one more year? The answer is no. They've already made the decision. Brian Gutekunst has already said he doesn't regret the decision. It was more of a financial decision than anything else, although his play is beginning to decline. It's time to move on, and that's just the fact of the matter. We're going to sign him back to a one-day contract or whatever to make him a Green Bay Packer. He's going to retire a Green Bay Packer, and that's the most satisfaction we're going to get out of this. Now, let's talk about the defense and your obligation to scream and support this team. Now, we'll get back to the other part of the question. The other part of the other person's question. Just leave me alone. I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm on a thing here. Zadarius Smith reminds me of Julius Peppers. He is just he's got that really deep voice and he's just got this this build his his facial structure his body structure he's just a monstrous human being he looks like the nicest person in the world but if i met Zadarius Smith and it was just me and him and there was no other eyewitnesses i don't care how nice he was being to me and i would be willing to bet he'd be very nice that man is terrifying if he came out and said, hey, I'm Zadarius Smith. I'm the new outside linebacker of the Green Bay Packers. I know you. You're the Pack Daddy. You've got the greatest podcast in the world. I just want to shake your hand, man. I really appreciate you. I would hand him my wallet, and I would beg him not to hurt me. He is terrifying. Preston Smith is the obvious. Or is the obvious. The opposite. I shouldn't say the opposite. He's obviously a monstrous guy, but compared to Zadarius, it's not just this inherent thing. He just has the, he has the Mike Daniels attitude. He's the kind of guy that doesn't, I mean, again, if I saw him in person, he's probably a gigantic monster. I mean, he's 265 pounds of muscle. He's a big dude. But he's more got that stone-cold killer look. And I, I'm not even going to call it necessarily like Mike. He's, he looks like Mike Daniels on the field when he's all jacked up. But that's what he looked like in the locker room when he's trying to be, like, happy. Like, oh, you just signed a bunch of money. How you doing? And he just looks at somebody, like, with his head cocked to the side and these dead eyes just looking at him. Although he's, like, contemplating in the back of his head, how many times he wants to punch you in the face for asking me that question? And then a very nice answer comes out. I'm just saying, these guys have an edge to them. They're different. They're different people. They're mean people. They can smile at you and all that stuff. But Preston Smith wants to hurt somebody, and Zadarius Smith is going to accidentally hurt somebody because these guys are mean, mean guys. And I've been saying it for a while, the Packers need that. Adrian Amos, who embraces the name Smash Amos. This is what the Packers need. Listen, everything about this I'm starting to like. It's not the all-in move. It's not the Justin Houston where you're going to get possibly a top 10 pass rusher or or D Ford who's maybe going to be the best pass rusher. This is different. This is youth, which I'll talk about that in a minute. Hopefully, if I, I there's a lot of things I'm pushing off. We'll see what we actually get to. There's the 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 idea of just bringing up the defense there's the being well-rounded so you're not getting one thing really well and a bunch of stuff that's just not good. These are 
but also the, the, the mentality of the defense. Taking that Mike Daniels mentality and just saying, no, 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 no. This is our defensive mentality now. This isn't Mike Daniels as an animal. This, is, this defense is horrifying. And the idea of having Kenny Clark and Mike Daniels on the inside with Preston Smith and Zadarius Smith on the edge and a- Adrian Amos just pacing back and forth in the backfield like, an, like a lion in a cage. I, l- listen, yeah, I'm a biased Packer fan, but I'm telling you, if you are an opposing fan and you're listening to this and you think I'm just making stuff up, th- the biggest knock against Preston Smith and Zadarius Smith is sometimes they get a little chippy and they might get a personal foul penalty for getting a little mean sometimes. Jair Alexander, how many times have I said... Dude got away with punching a tight end in the throat. This is, I mean, he he's a different kind of guy too because he is the he's he is like Zadarius Smith. If Zadarius Smith was a lot smaller, and I'm not going to compliment a man's looks, I would never do that. But I mean, he looks like he can maybe have a profession doing something else that just involved his looks. I'm just saying he's a good-looking dude. He's in fit. He he's in fit. He's in shape. Also fit. He doesn't. He in other words, he doesn't have this look of being a guy that's just like going to going to destroy somebody he's a smaller guy he's in shape big deal a lot of people look like that but on the field i i and i i keep referring back to this because my brain doesn't even believe it happened but i'm telling you it happened (laughs) he got into it with a tight end tight end didn't like jair so he pushed him not a big deal man like it's a shove like most people are going to look at that and maybe you shove him back maybe you're like (laughs) <laughs> oh, wow, you shoved me, big man. No, Jair just turned and cold cocked him in the neck. <laughs> it's just, so there's that. By the way, Josh Jones, excuse me, Josh Jackson, he kind of has a Preston Smith thing going on. Now, I know Josh Jackson, He's he's got some work to do. He's got to learn the system. He's got to bring his play up. But he's got those stone cold killer eyes. Kevin King, he's a Jair. He's the guy that's got the big smile, super nice guy. But have you seen him hit people behind the line? I'm just saying. If these guys would just embrace this mentality, and some of them already have, this is and can be and will be a violent defense. Now, I, I'm not just picking everybody and picking out little points. I don't think Tremont is violent. I think Tremont is old school Packers. It was it was talent players, guys with just that are just cerebral, that are talented, that are you know act like you've been there before. It's a different kind of thing, right? Be, be, Packers defense and, and Packers talented players in general are just they're they're just exceedingly talented and that's awesome but i'm saying that this is different right i I don't necessarily think of blake martinez as a violent guy i mean i know he does that flexing thing afterward that looks pretty horrifying because he's jacked but i don't really see him as that kind of a play i'm not i'm not just going down the list and picking everybody even kenny clark i don't think is i mean i just i don't care what he is because he's just good i'm fine with it i'm just trying to say what what this defense needs is a a mentality change but it wow that segue got out of control so there's that but you got, we, we have to get jacked up about this defense. When that defense is on the field, get jacked up, man. Because the fact of the matter is there are teams who have an advantage, and that advantage is, well, partially because they're in a dome that is built to amplify noise, and they also pump noise in, which should be illegal. And by illegal, I mean federally illegal, where these people should be put in prison because shame on you. That's, I'm not being serious, but that really is annoying and unfair and uncool. But Packers fans, man, we got to be better. We got to get out there and support this defense. You want them to get jacked up. You know what jacks people up? 80,000 people screaming at the top of their lungs. That jacks people up. You want somebody who's an an animalistic person? I talked about how uh, you kind of get into that headspace where you're kind of an animal. This was a long time ago. I I listened to a, just for fun, I went back and listened to a podcast from uh, from last year because I thought that would be kind of fun. I listened to the, uh, but what, it doesn't matter. Who cares which one? But anyways, I talked about it in that podcast. But, I mean, that, that's going to get guys fired up. If, if you're trying to just go destroy somebody, 80,000 people screaming at the top of their lungs is going to be motivation. 80,000 people sitting in their seats texting on their phones is not really going to inspire a lot of passion from these players. It's kind of embarrassing. With a couple people standing up clapping and the people behind them going, Sit down! I can't see! Young man! Young man, sit down, please! I can't see! I'm not doing that voice because it's an old lady back there. I'm saying it's it's a bunch of people acting like old ladies. Maybe it's an old lady. I don't know. I don't care. Whoever it is, stop doing that. And if you are an old lady and you can't stand up, that's fine. Because you know what you're sitting on? It's a metal bleacher. Take your cane and start banging it on the metal bleacher. Do your part. 
but I'm getting excited about the defense, and, and, and this is fully understanding. We did not get the best of the best. We got very good football players that are very well-rounded football players, and I'm leaving the guard out of this, and I'm sorry that I'm doing that, but I, I just can't in good conscience say all four of these guys are good football. I can say they all have high upside, and I can definitely say the Packers expect these guys to start because they paid them all starter money, but I just don't have a lot to go on with, with our new guard, uh, Billy Turner. But we'll get there. Not today, someday. But uh, but I acknowledging all that, I'm just excited about an attitude change. Zadarius Smith comes from a culture in which this was the best and most terrifying defense in the NFL, the Baltimore Ravens. He comes from a culture that is Terrell Suggs. You know how, you know what kind of defenses Terrell Suggs played with? Killers. And I kind of mean that literally. Some of the meanest, scariest people on this planet playing football, playing defense in, in a culture that is just all about defense. And Washington isn't all that different. If, if, if Washington had, had uh, you know, th- their offense was always terrible. They're, they're put together horribly. They're run horribly. It's just a kind of a mess in Washington. But they've had some pretty good defenses over the years. And it's usually up front where those defenses are. Play with a lot of big Alabama boys over there. And of course, Adrian Amos playing with the Chicago Bears. And that Bears defense was lethal last year. I had mentioned it was one of the best defenses as far as pro football focus score goes that has been around since, you know, Legion of Boom, Seattle Seahawks. So these are guys that that are good people with good hearts, but they come from very good defenses. They're very well-rounded people. They're young people, and they're very violent people. They all fit that exact same mold. It was very clear what the Packers are going for. And Billy Turner, Turner kind of fits that as well. I'm not sure about the violence, but young, versatile, lots of upside. So, I mean, let, let, let's get excited, man. There's, there's no other purpose of the offseason other than to get excited and assume our team is going to win a Super Bowl. But as fans, we, we got to start getting jacked up. We got to start taking this seriously. We got to start embracing the fact that this is a defensive football team. We, we can't just, and, and, and listen, it's all we know. Brett Favre, Aaron Rodgers, all that stuff. I mean, it's just, this is an everything that made the Packers great, everything the Packers are known for, it's offense and it's quarterbacks. Bart Starr. But let's not forget the, the championship teams of the Green Bay Packers. What was it about? You're telling me Lombardi era defense wasn't any good? You're lying. When we won in the 90s with Brett Favre, what is it that got us over the hump? It was defense. It was Reggie White. It, it, was, it was from top to bottom that defense was dominant. 2010, I'm sorry to tell you. We, we've talked about it. I went back to that year. I did a whole episode. If you, have, if you don't know what it is, go back and find it. Go scroll through my episodes. You'll find it. It's there somewhere. I don't know what it's called. Recapping 2011. Way back. I think it's Way Back Machine. It's a really fun episode, but it detailed it from top to bottom. I went back and actually looked at the articles of the time. What was the conversation? What was going on? It was the defense. It stepped up, and it was dominant that year. If we want to get back into this, we, we need Aaron Rodgers to get back on track. We need this offense to get back on track. We need to find a number two wide receiver. We need to improve the offensive line. All that stuff is true. But every single one of us knows that until this defense becomes scary, until this defense starts in, inspiring fear in other teams, until this defense starts pitching shutouts, starts winning games for the offense when it can't show up, until that happens, there is no Super Bowl in our future. We got to start embracing it. We got to start getting excited about it, and we have to start supporting it. All right, let's get back to uh, to the other question. The other question. No, I I don't think, and I do apologize to Ben from Sockville. Typically, what I do is play the recording. But two things. Number one, I did have somebody say thank you for not playing the recording and just saying it out loud because I did not want to have to hear my own voice. And I'm kind of thinking that maybe some people don't call in and leave messages because they don't want their voice played. If that's the case, just say that. You can call in and be like, hey, man, this is John from Smithstinton. First of all, don't put my voice on the podcast. Here's my question. All right, so just, just lay that out there. Otherwise, I probably am going to play it. But beyond that, um, the, the, it's a minute and a half long thing, and the first half is Jordy, and I, I just, even though I just took 30 seconds explaining why I'm not going to play it. But anyways, the, the second part of his question is about Blake Bortles. So Ben from Sockville, thanks a lot for, uh, for calling. I think my instant gut reaction on the backup quarterback situation uh I mean I I like it and I don't I, I think the Packers have to address this a little more seriously um I'm trying as hard as I can to not have the Aaron Rodgers or bust mentality because it shouldn't be that way we've seen teams win Super Bowls with backup quarterbacks no I okay so please don't take it where you're taking it right now 
point is, Aaron Rodgers gets hurt. It happens. And whether he's coming in for a half or a game or two games or whatever, the Packers have to... And, li- and listen, I think this is a bigger thing, and I was thinking about this yesterday. The NFL is doing a good job, and I think it's important. I do think it's important to get away from quarterback or bust. The new thing in the NFL clearly is get quarterbacks on their rookie contracts, push all in, and try to win a Super Bowl. Now, the, the, the problem is how many of these teams are going to pay that second that second contract, which is a massive contract, and still have the ability to compete. I think what the NFL wants to do and what I would love for a team to figure out to do so that we stop paying ridiculous money to quarterbacks would be for teams to find a way to make quarterbacks sort of a a piece in a system. I mean, you look at Nick Foles, for example. Nick Foles going to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Nick Foles is not going to be the the main piece of that offense. That is going to be a team that is identity is focused around defense and uh, running the football with Leonard Fournette. And listen, the Jaguars were close with Blake Bortles. If they had Blake Bortles but a little bit better of a quarterback, I don't know who would be an example of some. Oh, maybe like Nick Foles. Not a great quarterback, but good enough which is really the only question that you had for the Jaguars. Again, not to, to derail this question. We'll get back to it, but I'm just trying to solidify my point here. The Jaguars were within an inch, but Blake Bortles couldn't get him over the hump. Who's somebody that when crunch time comes down to it, they're able to get over the hump? Foles absolutely can because Foles absolutely did. So the point is it would be nice for teams to start learning how to do that. And I think the Packers have to start the process of learning how to win without Aaron Rodgers. Now, there's going to be another quarterback, but the odds of this quarterback being another Aaron Rodgers are very slim. And I think the better course of action, although we need to find a replacement quarterback in the next year or two, whatever, and we need to start grooming them and developing them, and hopefully it's another Aaron Rodgers and we don't even have to worry about it, but I think the Packers need to start investigating what's happening in the NFL and looking at this idea and looking at the Jaguars and looking at some of these teams who maybe use quarterbacks as a system, a piece in a system. Because if teams can start figuring out how to win Super Bowls by paying starting quarterbacks that aren't super great, $22 million, like Foles, as opposed to $32 million, like Rodgers, well, a little more than that. And by the way, if, if Rodgers was signed this year as opposed to last year, that number just keeps going up. I mean, but who knows what the quarterback number is now. If, if Pat Mahomes were to be paid right now, he's getting paid $35 million. So again, when I, when I talk about Foles getting 22, that's, that's chump change. So yes, we do need to get more serious about that. I think the problem that I have is, number one, the amount of money. And I don't know what he's going to command, but quarterbacks aren't cheap. Number two, we have Kaiser. And not that Kaiser is any good, but... Uh, we do have LaFleur who did a lot of really good things with uh, quarterbacks. We'll see what he can do with Kaiser. Beyond that, we, we have a GM that traded to get Kaiser. So the idea that he's going to invest that much in Kaiser and then the very next year go out and say, well, that's not going to work, so I'm going to go out and pay somebody who everybody knows is not very good to be our number two, and then the guy that I wanted to develop to be my guy that I traded for because I really like him, he's going to fall down to three, and eventually we're just going to get rid of him because he's trash. So now we've spent a lot of money, and we gave away Demarius Randall to acquire two quarterbacks, neither of whom are any good at anything. And I, I think that the biggest problem is, and the question really should be, is this somebody that in, in a pinch can win us a football game. And I don't think Blake Bortles is that guy. And even if we're only talking about $11, $12 million, I mean, that's just, that's crazy. That's the rest of our money for, for, for Bortles, who I I don't even know definitively he would win the job over Kaiser. So if we're going to make some more moves, no, I don't want that. I I would rather we just go in the draft and try to get somebody, which is an option, especially now that we've done all this. I think maybe drafting somebody, whether it be fourth round, fifth round, sixth round, Again, not that I have any high expectations for what they'd be able to do, but just somebody else that comes in that fits LaFleur's scheme, that, that is, is somebody that can be developed to try to round out this room. But I think Kaiser needs to be the guy. Kaiser was somebody who was, you know, a potential first-round draft pick. He has all the tools. He just needs somebody to, to, to make him good enough. And he's not going to be our starter. You know, maybe we were wrong about Kaiser as far as his draft evaluation, that he'll never be a starter. But he he absolutely needs to be good enough to be able to be a quarterback that can step in for a game and win. I think that needs to be our direction. Uh, I I don't see a lot of upside with Blake Bortles. Because, again, it ultimately, even setting aside the money question, it ultimately comes down to when Aaron Rodgers goes out, is this person going to come in and win a football game? And I don't know how much faith I have in Blake Bortles to be that guy. So... 
I, I guess if, if you could, if it was possible, which it's not, to pay him as though he's a rookie, like give him $500,000, I'd say, yeah, let's go get Blake Bortles right now. Because he, he, he does have some ability, and he's better than Kaiser and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, even, even as a backup, quarterbacks get paid a lot of money, and it's going to soak up the rest of the money we have. So it just I, I just, I think I'm out on that. And I also understand the Nathaniel Hackett uh, connection there. But, um, I mean, come on. Nathaniel Hackett off, also couldn't do anything with the guy. So I'm out. All right, we're going to keep rolling along. we got another question here. This one I am going to throw on uh, the podcast. Although I'm disappointed that he doesn't have a Boston accent, he does have a radio voice, so we got to throw it on here. Hey, man, it's Sam from Boston checking in on this crazy Tuesday. Um, first things first, this has probably been the most fun off season that I can remember ever since I've been following the NFL. I mean, from Odell Beckham to the Packers landing four new legitimate starters, today has been huge. And I think the biggest piece that nobody is really talking about right now is the fact that the Packers landed these four guys in the Darius Smith, Preston Smith, um, Adrian Amos, and our new offensive lineman, is that there's no true glaring need on, in our roster right now. At 12, we have the freedom to do literally whatever we want, and that's got me fired up, man. I can't wait for this upcoming April. All right, man, looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Take it easy. So this is one of the awesome things about uh, what we've done so far. Uh, I, I don't know that I can buy into the idea that we don't have any needs, but at least positionally we've attacked it, right? If we just say guard and look at the fact that there's a person there, we can say that that's not a need anymore, although I'm skeptical about the guard that we have, and I also am not a big Lane Taylor fan. If we just say safety, we can say that it's been addressed, although we have one, and it would be nice if we had two, possibly three. And then off the edge, it's a lot better. I still think we can add another piece. Um, again, it would be nice, even if it's just, even if it's not at 12, if we wait until the later rounds to just get that guy who's strictly a speed guy off the edge, just to give us that other dimension. And of course, there's also linebacker because we just have one linebacker. You get what I'm saying. But it, it does absolutely get us to the point where we don't have to panic at 12. We don't have to package up our two picks and trade up to get somebody that maybe isn't worth the trade up. But we don't have anybody off the edge, so we have to go up and get Brian Burns. We have to go up and get Josh Allen. We have to, have to, have to, have to, because if they're not there, we're doomed, and we can't win. The other really cool thing, and I kind of talked about it when I said we might be able to get a quarterback, is somebody had sent me their seven-round mock draft. I haven't done any mock drafts since all this craziness has happened. But um, everything, not just first round, everything through seven rounds starts to make more sense. You know, getting a running back makes more sense because you before this, every single pick was reflective of all our needs. So you look at a mock draft and it's like, but you didn't address this and you don't. What about this? Now, instead of saying, but we have to get a safety early. I mean, if he, what is Adrian Amos, a fifth round pick? Eddie Jackson, their other safety who was number one in the NFL last year. I think he was like a third round pick. I'm not saying that this is a path we should choose, but I'm just saying if we don't get somebody until the third round, we don't necessarily have to freak out and panic and say, well, I guess our secondary is going to be trash because we still have Jair, we still have Kevin King, we still have um, Josh Jackson, who hopefully these guys can all improve, including Jair, and we have Amos. So it's, it's just it's just an additional piece that's going to be better than, you know, he, he's, he's an additional piece and he's the number two and he's underneath Amos's wing and he's, he's just, he's got a big support cast as opposed to before where it's like we throw a guy into a secondary in which nobody's any good and it's like, okay, you have to be the best now. And then they're not just not just very good because there's no pass rush and there's no other corners that are any good and there's no other safeties. That are, it's a different environment. So yeah, it just it just absolutely opens everything up. And even though there are still kind of needs in terms of having 11 good players on defense and 11 good players on offense, which by the way, there isn't a single team in the NFL that has 11 good players on offense and 11 good players on defense. There's not one. Everybody's got a weakness somewhere. And you know what? Some of them are still very... Look at... And maybe I'll do this again. I kind of did this before before we did all this free agency stuff, but just to kind of look at, for example, the Rams. They don't have good pass rushers. I shouldn't say that. That's ridiculous. They don't have good outside linebacking pass rushers. They just they didn't have it. They didn't have good linebackers in general. Look at the Chiefs' defense as a whole. I mean, yeah, they had, you know, three good players up front, but their linebackers were just abysmal. Their corners were not any good. Their safeties were horrible. You know, with, with the exception of a little bit here, a little bit there, it just it's not. It was a terrible defense, but they were dominant. The Patriots, despite being a good, well-rounded football team, had a lot of deficiencies, areas that could absolutely have been improved. 
right? The the Bears and their defense was great, but look at what their quarterback, right? Every team. So it's not even so much at this point, well, we got to patch every single hole because if we don't fix that, we're do nobody is going to fix every hole. Everybody's coming with holes. It's about taking the talent you have and turning it into something. That's like the same thing I said with the Browns. Okay, fine. They went out and stacked a bunch of elite talent. What can you do with it? So right now we've got a boat that can float, and that's all that matters. And from here we're just, we're, you know, it's about stacking cannons on it, man. It's, it's This thing will float. It'll drive. It's not perfect. It's a little rickety. But at the end of the day, all we need is a good captain to steer this thing and, you know, just just go out and win the battle with what you got and, and through the draft, stack the talent. Um, and, and to be honest, pick number 12 is, is giving me heartburn. I almost want to trade back just because I don't know what to do with it anymore. I mean, if, if the Green Bay Packers genuinely believe that uh, Ed Oliver is everything that he's hyped up to be, great. I'm not willing to necessarily overlook all the negatives. I understand the athleticism is there, but for a guy that plays for Houston, I mean, he's not exactly in the SEC to only have single-digit sa- I mean, what did he have, like three, four, five sacks a year? His rookie year, he had five sacks uh, in 12 games. 2017, 12 games, five sacks. 2018, eight games, three sacks. So the, the, the potential's there, the athleticism's there, everything's kind of crazy in there. But you got a very undersized guy that supposedly is a much better fit in a 4-3 defense that does not have the production in a school in which he would have been the easily the best player on the field. Why wasn't there more production? Can he play at a smaller size? Will he fit a 3-4 defense, or does he need to be in a 4-3? I'm just saying. But again, if, 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 if we're really going to play this game where he's the next Aaron Donald, fine. Then yeah, of course you got to take him. Brian Burns. Do we have concerns about Brian Burns? Are we good? I mean, it, it's it's really just a matter of, I'm, I'm not saying we should trade back if there's really, really good talent. Just take it. That's the whole point of all this is now you can take best player available. But what I'm saying is if we're now into that next tier where there was four elite guys, you had Quinnen and you had Bosa and you had whoever, Allen and whoever your guys would be, they're all gone. Trade back, man. I've never been so excited to trade back in my life. I've, I've been against the trade-up thing ever since we refused to tank. Because as I said, that basically means that by winning football games, we nullified our pick 30. I don't want to rehash what I talked about daily, but I'm sure I've got a lot of new listeners, listeners since then. Once it was clear we cannot get into the playoffs, it became clear we needed to stop winning football games. Because basic math tells us, if you take A12 and you take a 30, and you trade up to a position that you basically could have had by just not winning those last few games, those last few wins nullified pick 30. Basic logical deduction. I don't want to nullify 30. I want to take advantage of 30. Do not trade up. Get an additional player. So very against trading up unless it's just, you know, a dominant player, but it still makes me sad because we could have just sat at pick six or whatever and got a dominant player had we just not won those last few games, but whatever. Again, I don't want to rehash that and relive that nightmare of screaming into this microphone every day. Please stop winning because that was a nightmare. I also need to do my best to, when draft day comes, not be the guy that sits there at pick six and says, so we're at pick six now, the spot we would have been at. What up, dance party? The spot we would have been at had we not won those last few meaningless games, but here we are. But anyways, keeping it positive, there's there's almost nothing that we can do that would be upsetting because at this point, at, at this particular point in time, although we can absolutely improve and there's still a couple patches here and there and things that could make things better, I would still really like to get another wide receiver. I know I just said what I said about Jordy. I'm talking about long term and I'm talking about somebody who has the potential to be a solid number two, not just because of chemistry and hey let's just do back shoulder throws all day because we're in sync and and that we got the timing down i'm talking about just a legit number two that we can have for a very long time because essentially what i'm looking at is gutekunst has set us up for the next foreseeable future but there's still certain things that i think are a barrier to us being a very good football team i don't think our defensive line is a barrier so i don't see ed oliver is a is a must draft again if he's that good draft him Not debating that. I'm just talking about what are the few things we need that are going to get us there this year. Because we can start having those conversations now. Because we have enough to move this train. What do we need to get over the hump this year? Another receiving threat. Now, maybe that's a tight end. Maybe we get a guy like Fant. Maybe we do a little bit of both. Offensive line, not really. I I think it needs to be improved. It needs to be better. But um, 
you know, again, there's teams out there with worse offensive lines that get it done. You know, the Packers are still going to be able to run the ball with this offensive line. We did it last year. The, the Packers can block. We did it last year. A lot of the problems we had last year were Aaron Rodgers holding onto the ball because nobody's getting open. So would I like that to improve? Absolutely. But if we assume that the Packers know what they're doing and we just got a new right guard, then we can draft for talent. We can draft for depth. We can maybe try to upgrade our left guard position. But otherwise, I, th- I think we have a good enough line. Would I like it to be better? Yes. Do we need it to be better in order to get over the hump? No. I think a, a secondary receiving threat behind Adams is going to be the next piece that we need to get over the hump. The next most important thing maybe would be that other uh, safety because I'm still not necessarily sold on the secondary. However, if, if the pass rush is better and the corners take a step, that's going to be massive with Adrian Amos, but we still need another safety. So a safety and a receiving threat are maybe the two biggest needs. The only other thing I could possibly think that could help is, again, a pass rush specialist. That's why at 12, as far as these needs are concerned, getting a guy like Burns, if he's available, even... I don't know about Montez Sweat, because Montez Sweat is more of like the guys we have. Nothing against him necessarily, and I know he had a lot of production in college, but at the NFL level, when when your biggest... And listen, he's got more, he's got more speed than anybody would know what to do with, so maybe fine, but I I just worry a little bit about his ability to bend, and yes, he had a great three cone and all that, but the tape is what it is. As much as I hate saying the tape, because people who don't know anything about the tape keep saying the tape, when I put on the tape, just be quiet, man. You don't put on the tape. You watched five minutes of a guy's play in one game and came up with some conclusions that anybody who watches football can come up with using technical terms, and you're just obnoxious. Sorry, that drives me nuts. And, and, Okay, again, a segue on a segue here. The reason it drives me nuts is because I see the amount of work people put in. The reason I constantly say that I stay in my lane, I stay in my lane, I'm not a scout, I don't do these things, is because I watch the people that put in the work and I see how much work goes into it, and I want them to have those credentials, and I don't say things like, I put on the tape, and here... No, because I don't put on the tape. I go watch a game as a fan and say, oh, that was really good. Look how he broke on that ball. I mean, it's, it's things that fans learn as you watch football your entire life. You know certain things. Just because you understand what a route is. Oh, look how he breaks on a post. Like, okay, everybody knows what a post is, man. You're, whatever. It's annoying. But, but as far as getting over the hump, receiving threat. So tight end, wide receiver, safety, and linebacker maybe are the, are the four things. A linebacker that can help with the coverage, but also against the run because the defense was not good at all against the run. Uh, specifically somebody who's kind of violent because, you know, that's our culture now. Um, another safety. Um, Whereas before I really wanted to get a free safety, I think Adrian Amos has the ability to be that safety, so it, it provides us some... I mean, I, I think a well-rounded guy is going to be ideal. I don't want a guy that's just a box safety. I don't want another Josh Jones. I want a guy that can play safety, especially in too high. I don't need a guy that has that can be single high. That's not necessary because those guys just rarely ever exist. But if you get a guy that's versatile enough, that it's similar to what they did in Chicago. They just rotated. I mean, you, you typically would say Eddie Jackson was the free safety and Adrian Amos was the strong safety, but they, they were interchangeable. And I'd like to have something like that in Green Bay. So getting another safety to uh, help in coverage, getting another safety that's a good tackler and, and help in the run support, getting a linebacker that can help a little bit with the coverage. And as much as, you know, okay, well, we got Oren Burks. I don't really, I just, I don't care, man. If he's able to come out and win the job, I'm not going to be upset because in the third round, we got a linebacker. Whoever wins the job wins the job, but somebody's got to step up. And I'm just, I'm over it. I'm tired of saying, what about this guy? What about that guy? What about we drafted this? I don't care. At this particular point in time, we have Blake Martinez and nobody. And I'm including Oren Burks in that nobody category. I hope he can step up. I hope he can be everything we wanted him to be. But whatever. He wasn't. He isn't. Now he's got to compete with whoever it is we're drafting. Um, But yeah, then get some wide receivers, and I'd prefer we do it early. I would not like to wait until the third round or later until we got a wide receiver. We've had a lot of success. Granted, it was with Ted Thompson, but, you know, similar kind of scouts and similar kinds of ways of looking at things. If we can get out of the first and second round with a tight end and a wide receiver and either a safety or a pass rusher or whatever, I'm pretty happy. Because that is what I think this is. This is a team that has ability, but maybe can start patching up some of the things that are going to help us right now. And I I do think the biggest thing that's going to help us right now is another receiver. Because this offense just couldn't function. Aaron Rodgers couldn't function with the guys we had. And again, yes, I understand Equinemius, and I understand Marquez, and I understand Jamon, and I get Kumaro, and I understand all these different guys, and Geronimo, and everybody loves Geronimo. 
fact of the matter is a lot of these guys were there. A lot of these guys played and this offense couldn't go because Aaron Rodgers had one receiver and nobody else. So we draft somebody. That person is going to be number two. And if anybody else would like to join the party and be number three, four, five and, and get their stuff together and be a good wide receiver. Great. How many people were upset when we had Jordy Nelson as our number you know, four on the team and Randall Cobb was our number five? That wasn't a problem. So whatever. Point is, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Um, and I think now in the draft, we have the ability yet. Yeah, we also, we do have the ability to draft best player available and that's awesome. But we also have the ability to kind of use the draft as an all in situation. And I, I guess what I mean by that, and I'll, I'll end with this thought. I've talked about how you get to the point where you get into tiers and there's going to be two, two players, three players, five players, eight players, 10 players, however many players are kind of in the similar tier. Whereas before we're drafting for sort of the negative need as opposed to a positive need. So a negative need is, and I'm kind of making this up, but kind of not. Negative need would be we have to draft this because we have such a massive deficiency that we just can't field the football team without it. It was, you know, our edge rushers a week ago. It was safety a week ago. Now we can start drafting for positive need, which is the idea of we have players, but if we draft this player, it, it's going to help us in 2018. It's, it's going to help us now. It's getting us over the hump. It's, it's a positive need. It's not bringing us up to zero. It's taking us from zero to 10. That's kind of the cool thing about this. So now maybe instead of, let's say at, at 30, we've got, so, okay, we got Ed Oliver or we got uh, TJ Hawkinson or whatever. Now at 30, we don't have an edge rusher and we don't have a wide receiver. We, we, we got to figure out which one we're going to do. Maybe at 30, we take the wide receiver because we've already got edge rusher up to zero. The question is now, how do we get over the hump? How do we start winning football? How do we become dominant? How do we fix things that are broken? Wide receiver is going to do that. Wide receiver is going to help us get into the playoffs more. So it's just another way to kind of attack things, and it, it, it just opens up our options a lot more to whereas we, we're not handcuffed to, well, we don't have a choice, we have to draft this. We do have a choice now. Anyways, we're going to call it a day. Got to get rocking and rolling out of here. It's Friday. It's starting to warm up. It's flooding everywhere, but I don't even care because it's warm flooding. I'll swim to work. I don't even care. It's glorious, and I could not be more happy. Uh, enjoy your Friday. We're going to have some fun, uh, hopefully starting today, possibly this weekend. Uh, again, the plan is try to reach out to as many as I can. I don't know what my schedule necessarily is going to be like, but try to knock out some of these um, mock drafts with the fans. I want to release them over the next several days, one at a time, um, as bonus episodes. In other words, it's not going to be my thing. It's just going to be, I'm still going to do the daily podcast, and then there'll be a bonus episode. Um, and then as we get through that, we're going to st- I'm going to start begging for more reviews, and we're going to find another little reward. I've already got a couple things in mind of what I'd like to do uh, one is an activity, but I think that's going to be just for Patreon people. So if you're not involved in that, uh, be sure to check that out. Link is in the description. But I'm also thinking about maybe doing some giveaways and whatnot. So we're going to have some fun, man. We're going to make this a little bit more interactive, and we're going to try to grow the show in the off season. But otherwise, you folks, enjoy your Friday. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.